There's this guy I met on the other day who's um, very involved in portfolio and analytics doing environmental and sustainable investment, which is an alternative form of asset management. That might be interesting there. Um, and he said he studied French. He's not French, but he studied French. And he didn't study economics. He said economics from my point of view is quite dismal. And Sometimes it doesn't make too much sense in the sense that a lot of people argue economies will grow and have to grow forever from a normative perspective. And wish I could point out that that's not what economics is about. There is a lot more um, to do with that. However, I couldn't really comment on his, his arguments. Hopefully I get to do it by the end of um, my time at UCL. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Regardless of all these people, not just these two, but um, many others, who told me why economics is, um, what's the connection between studying economics and reading the changes or doing some greater good. I still pursue my studies with many of my friends here, um, and great professors and stuff, because, because of many reasons, one of which I learned and re-realized when I went up to Edinburgh, with a couple people who've also been there. There was a great festival and conference there about um, many different, not just professors and practitioners, but students, most importantly, doing some very creative, very great stuff within the area of economics. And perspectives I got to observe there and engage myself with were so fresh. It was very different from economics I learned from my, from my high school. And I'm pretty sure it's the same case whichever high school he went to. And that's what I that's one reason that it's more to do with um, just doing math or stats or just having this thought that economies will grow forever. The other reason is, and it's something I started thinking recently, it's important not just for students, academics and practitioners operating within the area of economics, but for everyone, regardless of what they're, what they're studying, or even those who don't pursue any academic um, stuff, because, because of so much misinformation going on these days. Misinformation around economies um, are affecting people so heavily that a lot of people are saying, whether believe it or not, it has affected decisions that were made during Trump's election campaign, Brexit, etc. And um, that's why I believe studying economics, opening these um, discourses to what's the proper, what's the better way of doing economics, teaching, learning, and just being involved in these discussions around the area of economics is so important almost more important than ever. And I'm very lucky and still feel very optimistic to be around some people, three of whom are here today, um, who are trying to establish better way or promote new ways of doing economics, as I said. So today we have Wendy Carlin, professor at UCL and the director of core project. Lillian Fisher, editor of the Rethinking Economics on Introduction to Pluristic. Uh, Plus Economics and Henry Wells Bauer, Chief Executive of Promoting Economic Pluralism. Some of these terms you may not have heard before, since um, pluralism and rethinking, or maybe even core if you're not from UCL, might be some new fresh terms. However, we'll get to, we're quite lucky to have these three here tonight today to hear about them. So without further ado, please welcome um, these three panelists with round of applause. And Thank you. called the curriculum revolution and I want to talk about uh, what we've been doing in the core project uh, also some perspectives about the new things that we're doing so let me just um, get going this is what we this is the question that we've asked in classrooms all around the world before we started teaching uh, a class in economics and 
these are the responses of students in Bogota at the University of Dos Andes. And if you're still getting up to scratch in Spanish, this is the translation. So the size of the word reflects the frequency with which it was um, given as an answer to this question. So you can see that um, this was uh, at the intense moment of the peace process in Colombia. The inequality, sustainability, the, what Dupo was mentioning, questions about growth, poverty, basic income, automation, they're the issues that were raised by the students in Bogota. And here is our first day of term uh, a year ago. Our extremely prescient students being worried already about Donald Trump um, <laughs> at that time. This is students at Humboldt University. You can see the same themes keep recurring as the, as the topics that students think their economics course should be addressing. This is this year at the Nova Business School in Lisbon, a very similar set of topics. Uh, here is a completely different sample of students from Arkansas State University. Uh, you can see that those students are particularly exercised about the question of debt, and here they're um, further probing, they're, they're referring to their debt, right? debt rather than a problem of debt. Uh, in, at the level of the economy as a whole. Uh, a completely different uh, group again. These were all the new graduate recruits at the Bank of England, 98 of them uh, a year ago. I, I circulated the whole room with a piece of paper before I said a word and uh, before there was any sense of what the talk was going to be about. And I collected, I collected my data took it back to the office and processed it. I was very surprised to get this um, word cloud from the, a group who've decided to be professional economists, yet their concerns are the same. Okay, it's inequality, the productivity puzzle, they're worried about um, the future of work, so there are robots down there. There are questions of sustainable development, global warming. It's, I think it's quite remarkable when you, you know, look across a very large uh, sample of students around the world and here, graduating students, and they come up with the same kinds of issues. So this is a list of the problems that they're, uh, if you like, animated by, exercised by, that they think we as economists should be, should be addressing, we should be equipping you, those of you who are um, studying economics, to think about inequality, instability, unemployment, the future of work, wealth creation and growth, um, environmental problems. And the, the, the point I want to make in the, the time that I've got is to argue that these problems that students want to study require new concepts being brought into the introductory class um, and hopefully taken through, uh, in, through the curriculum in the teaching of economics. So what are these new concepts? If we're going to talk about inequality, then we have to talk about rents, bargaining power, and institutions. Instability, we need to think about prices as information and to understand about the dynamics of price setting. To understand about unemployment, we have to know about incomplete contracts in labour and credit markets. We need to bring Schumpeterian rents, okay, that's just one of the kinds of rents that are characteristic of the economy. So innovation or Schumpeterian rents uh, into the curriculum and to place disequilibrium as a central concept that's going to help us understand the dynamics of the economy, why people make decisions, why people decide to introduce a new technique or a new product. And finally, uh, last but absolutely not least, that uh, it's, it's thinking about environmental problems and the future of sustainability that makes us uh, realize that we need to understand about social interactions and about other regarding preferences. So why is this a revolution in the curriculum? It's, it's a revolution in the curriculum because the way that the uh, 
standard courses in economics are taught is that they really go back to the 1948 Samuelsonian paradigm, the famous book by Samuelson uh, called Economics. Um, and what, what the, the Samuelson approach to thinking about economics was basically to put together the, the, what's often called the neoclassical paradigm of Marshall, Hugo, and to combine that, remember this was in 1948, with the lessons that had come out of the Depression um, associated with, with the contributions of Keynes. So that really established the, the kind of content of the textbooks, the view about people, and this relates mainly to, many of these things relate to the, if you like, the non-Keynes bit of it, and there's really a disjuncture in that Samuelsonian paradigm that was never really brought to the surface. But the idea basically was that people were far-sighted and self-interested, that mainly what we were talking about were price-taking markets, Information and con con uh, contracts were complete. Institutions were really just markets. History was of very little interest. Uh, if you think about a world in which there's just one equilibrium, then you can't really be very interested in history. It's not going to teach you very much. Uh, power was uh, limited to a very narrow part of the part of the uh, thinking about economics, basically to monopoly or to government, and. Uh, rent seeking was just associated with rent seeking activities that create inefficiency and not those rents that generate innovation that I mentioned a moment ago. Okay, so that was the, the prevailing way of teaching economics. Uh, we have in the, the core project, we're trying to argue that there's a really dramatically new paradigm that we need um, for teaching economics. And to do that, we have to not just take the insights of Marshall, Pigou, Keynes, Smith, Ricardo, Marx, and who came before them, but we also need to bring in some other uh, 20th century thinkers, mid-century thinkers, so we have to use the insights of Nash to help us understand about strategic interactions among all the different key actors in the economy, Hayek's insight about the role of information, so that information is scarce and local. Schumpeter, I've already mentioned, the idea of the entrepreneur. Remember the famous Bush question about whether the French had a word for entrepreneur? Um, and the idea of creative destruction. Uh, Herbert Simon, talking about human motivation and organizations. Albert Hirschman, Exit, Voice and Loyalty. I've just given you some indication of where these different thinkers appear in the different units in, in the core text, the economy, and social norms and how to manage common property using the insights uh, from Alan Austin. So that just gives some sense of where we're coming from when we lay out a very different way of thinking about the elements that make up uh, a new paradigm in economics. So this right-hand column, if you look, just look at the people, are, people are also cognitively limited. They have motives in addition to self-interest. They respond to social norms of fairness and punishment. And that means that when we come to evaluate policies and when we're thinking about policy design, we shouldn't just be thinking about the standard efficiency question, of whether there are unexploited mutual gains, but we should also be thinking about normative questions about fairness. And we should be equipping you, all of you, to be able to think about both of those dimensions when you're um, evaluating uh, outcomes. So I'm not going to go through all of the dimensions on the right-hand side, but uh, you, can, you can read more, more about that in the box piece. The basic point is that a different conception of human behavior introducing strategic interaction as at the center of the study of economics, as well as the role of limited information, that these, these new things, right, that, that were new ideas in economics that are, that are part of research economics, but had never been brought into the, into the classroom. That's what we need to do if we're going to bring economics alive and answer those questions that students were writing down. And let me try to link this to the intellectual basis for a neoliberal economic uh, agenda for policy and uh, optimistically to its demise. 
Okay, so that neoliberalism as economic policy, uh, I would argue, has, uh, would not have succeeded had its economic tenets not been accepted, not been widely accepted inside and outside the discipline. So what were the kind of the real core of, of the, the neoliberal uh, paradigm from the perspective of, uh, of economics? Basically that people are self-interested, so the assumption of homo economicus on the one hand, and then the real, the next step, the really important step that was made to create the neoliberal policy agenda, and this was that policy that we should extend that view of self-interest away from individuals shopping, okay, and extend that idea to policymakers and to, to government and to all collective actors. In other words, policymakers, governments, collective actors are all self-interested. Okay, and if we, if we, uh, if, if that's the foundation, the foundations of the view of people and of society that we put at the heart of economics, then that will produce a defense of unregulated markets. But I would argue, using the insights from among others, those, uh, those great uh, mid last century thinkers that I, that I put up, I would argue that developments in economics in and related social sciences, including psychology, over the past 40 years challenge these tenets. <coughs> For the new policy paradigm, okay, and that's the job of the new generation to help build it, would place greater weight on collective action, both by governments and in civil society. I think it's probably the case, again optimistically, that the kinds of changes in technology that are happening uh, with a shift in the weight of, the, if you like, the type of capital that is now important, the physical capital, the intangible capital, that, that that sort of really fundamental change that's going on, that that favours such a shift and that what we are trying to do in the uh, in, in constructing new teaching material uh, is to bring the, the possibilities for imagining uh, a better functioning economy to students and to a wider public. So that's the, that's the, that's the idea. So let me just um, give you a few little examples. This is the idea that uh, interactions are central to how we understand the economy. I'm going to go quite fast, but just to... So the first in, uh, interaction is between the employer and the employee. This is the way we think about the labour market, and it gives us a view of the labour market in which there is always involuntary unemployment. So there's involuntary unemployment in equilibrium. We never have a clearing labour market. So placing these, these, this principal agent problem, if you like, this interaction between employers and employees makes the labour market very different from the market for uh, shirts, uh, bananas, or whatever. There's something very special about the labour market. <coughs> There's a conflict of interest over wages and effort. What's left out of the contract, obviously, effort. Uh, interestingly, when we think about conflicts of interest, and we think about you know, where, where are these ideas coming from, we could give a list of contemporary economists uh, but we can also go back and notice that, uh, that Marx and Coase, very different thinkers from very different eras, <coughs> had exactly the same idea about the fact that we had to understand the role of power if we we're going to understand relationships within the firm, and that's crucial to understanding about how the labour market operates. Okay, here are some nice pictures which I won't test you on, but uh, this, this allows us to uh, build a model from that interaction between the worker and the employer at the micro level, go up to the macro level and then find some data and show that this, uh, this is a, a way of thinking about you know, the labour market out there in the real world. We can then go to a second principal agent problem between lenders and borrowers and see that there's a very common structure of the problem in these two really central markets in the economy. So if we understand about the labour market, we understand about the credit market, 
then we have the foundations, for example, for understanding a lot about the aggregate economy and why we have fluctuations. Because we have credit constrained households and we have the economy fluctuating around uh, a labour market equilibrium in which there's, uh, there's always involuntary unemployment. So let me uh, give you one more example. So talk about uh, cyclical unemployment and aggregate demand. There's a really famous debate in economics between Keynes and the classics. So these are the classics. So who's this guy here? Always looking rather startled. This is Pigou. And who's this one? He looks really weird. <laughs> this is Marshall. Okay. Even more shocked than, of course, Keynes. So we can uh, set up a, a model trying to understand that there's, uh, about what's happened when there's been a, a negative demand shock in the economy. Unemployment goes up, we go from X to V, and then we want to get back again, right? So how do we, how do, we do that? And in these two models, and again, I'm not going to go through this in any detail, uh, the, the way we can set up a model using very simple tools to understand this is we can contrast Keynes's response, which was to use aggregate demand policies, and shift the demand curve facing the firm. This is happening at the level of the firm down below here. Or we can rely on flexible nominal wages and prices to adjust along the demand curve facing the firm to get us back to equilibrium. And then that can lead us to figure out why this may take a very long time and go wrong, and hence the kind of power of, uh, of many of Keynes's insights. So let me uh, give you another example. Economics can help us understand the effects of the policy of increasing competition. What do we care about? We want to know what's the effect on wages? What's the effect on unemployment? Think of those uh, the words in the word cloud. What's the effect on inequality? Here's the model. We can check out the, the read over from what's happening in the labour market to what's happening in terms of the Lorenz curve and therefore figure out the impact of a competition policy in reducing unemployment as the Gini coefficient falls. Just one more example, no more chance I hope. Uh, this is just to give you a taste to, to, to see how you can learn a set of tools which then turn out to be really useful to understand completely different problems. So here we're going to think about a bubble in the housing market on the one hand. So this is a problem of instability, multiple equilibria. This is the price of housing in this period this year. That's the price of housing next period. What happens is that there's an unstable equilibrium here. And we can have a boom that will take us up to here. When sentiment changes, this whole S-shaped curve can shift. We lose the tipping point and get shifted down to the low, the crash of the housing market. Why is that a useful model? Well, it's useful for thinking about housing markets, but it's also useful for thinking about environmental tipping points. So this is right, copy paste, same diagram, same model. Change the axes to sea ice in period T, sea ice in period T plus one and then include the, uh, the climate interaction, which is what's going to cause this S-shaped curve to shift and give you an environmental tipping point. So this just gives some kind of tiny taste that if you build up these tools, then you are empowered to go and analyze those questions that we saw throughout the work out. Let me suggest that history can teach us which theory is insightful. So this is Keynes. But Keynes maybe is not so great at understanding the great stagflation. We might actually learn something from Friedman, indeed from Lucas. But that's not going to help us understand the global financial crisis. But there we may well find that, who's this? Minsky? Yeah, Minsky is actually going to provide us with very useful insights. So different, different thinkers interacting with different events are going to give us, help us to build a set of tools that will equip us to understand um, the problems. So what's available? The free ebook online, I hope you all have a look at it. Um, it's got lots of 
uh, interactive charts so that you can explore the data, also understand the model building. There are lots of quizzes. What, what are we up to now? We're now building a new course called Economy, Society and Public Policy, which is for students not specializing in ex economics. We, would, we always welcome people getting involved. There are people in this room who have been involved in one way or another in developing the economy, so now we're working on the next one. So again, we welcome uh, people getting engaged. And that's it. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Wendy. My study is really... But we think economics and introduction to pluralist economics. I'll talk about the book first, and then I'll talk about why pluralism is important for the future of curriculum reform. For those of you who are not familiar with Rethink Economics, we're a student network that was founded in the aftermath of the financial crisis when many students weren't really satisfied with the economics teaching that they were getting at their universities and were asking for a different education. And so a network came together that started campaigning for a more pluralist economics that is more related to the real world, economics that's more accessible for people outside of the discipline of economics, and then related to that for curriculum reform to actually change economics so that it could live up to these standards. Um, we think economics is now a global network. We have local groups in Nigeria, Vietnam, the US, and obviously here in the UK. And in October this year, we published this book. Um, okay, I said the title a couple of times. Um, the idea for the book came up in 2014 when we think economics had uh, organized a lecture series with different people from different schools of thought and who'd introduced what they thought economics was and how it should be done. And the idea was to collect the transcripts of the lectures, put them together, and make a book out of it. The idea was uh, developed a bit further, and now we have a book with chapters that were actually written for that book specifically. If you a short overview of our chapters, you can see that they're quite diverse in terms of content and authors. So we have Marxist economics right next to Austrian economics, which almost never happens. Um, <laughs> institutional behavioral complexity. You see, it's a wide range of different schools of thought many of which you maybe have never heard before because they're not part of the standard economics curriculum. And what each chapter does is very basically introduce the reader to the theoretical foundation of the school of thought, to the way in which it conceptualizes the world, what concepts do they use, what do they mean, and what methods do they use to analyze the economy because there is more methods than just models if you want to do economics. It also shows some real world applications, where can we use this, where would it be useful to actually draw on the school of thought, um, and then highlights differences to mainstream or neoclassical economics, if you will. Um, so in this sense, the book could potentially someday be used as a supplementary textbook. It's not laid out to be a proper textbook on its own, that's not its goal. But it can be used for a course that still remains pretty standard, but the teacher wants to show students what other theories are out there, what, what maybe could also be done or thought, and then this book's pretty good because it gives a very, very short and concise overview over the different theories. What we're trying to achieve with it is we want to reach a wide audience, not restricted to economists or economic students. Um, we wanted to give each school of thought an equal space and importance, and why we wanted to do that will probably become clear later when I talk about pluralism. Um, and by not giving the readers any sort of normative or interpretative framework for the schools, we wanted to allow people to make up their own minds. We're not telling them, well, this school's good for that, and this school's better for that, but we're simply putting them out there for people to think for themselves. And then obviously what we hope for is that people who read it will then be motivated to engage in a dialogue about economics and about pluralist economics, which we clearly need to open up to more people to contribute. And so this is a quote from our introduction where we say that we want to enable the next generation of students and thinkers to embrace the discipline in its entirety, to encourage them to ask questions, 
question answers and dare to rethink economics. And I think this captures quite well what we're trying to do with the book. So I'll talk about what, what pluralism is, what it isn't, and why it is important for curriculum reform. Um, so metaphors are always a bit tricky, I know that. So I'll try not to overstretch this one. But I think that it might be helpful to very briefly think about curriculum reform as building the Tower of Babel. And so different people came together back then and they wanted to build the tower and then they all spoke different languages and were frustrated and left and the tower was never built. And I'm, I'm sometimes a bit afraid that this is what's happening right now in curriculum reform because there's so many different movements and people and initiatives and we all very much agree that we want to build something new. But when we talk about what that's supposed to be and what's this going to look like, it almost seems like we're speaking different languages because we don't seem to agree on, on that we use different concepts to describe what we want. And I think, I mean, core and rethinking economics have a history in not agreeing on what we want. And I think that there lies a danger because what we can then do is we can be frustrated and leave like the people left and the Tower of Babel was never built and we leave and there's never any change. And I think that we need to get past that point and start trying to understand each other and what we want and why we want it. And I'll go that first step talking about pluralism, what we think it is and why we think it is important. So pluralism is not, in our opinion, just erecting a new paradigm on top of the ruins of the old one. And it's also not anything goes. But that means that pluralism is really, really difficult. Because having a paradigm is super easy. You just know what you do because someone else thought it for you. And anything goes is easy because you don't have to think because everybody does what they want. But the middle ground is difficult because in the middle ground you have to talk to each other and you have to negotiate and you have to disagree. And that's hard. And pluralism is hard. And pluralism, one thought that's really important, pluralism is not necessarily heterodoxy or heterodox schools of thought. They can be pluralist. But if they insist that they just want to be the new paradigm or they want anything goes, then heterodox schools of thought and pluralism are necessarily the same. And I think that that's important to bear in mind. So I'll briefly say something about what Rethinking Economics thinks pluralism should be. And I put it out there to discuss and not to tell you what's right and what's wrong. It's pluralism of theories, of methods, and of disciplines. Pluralism of theories means to allow and to acknowledge the coexistence of different schools of thought that analyze economics. And this is basically what we do in our book. The chapters are all at the same length, they're all side by side, and nobody tells you which one is better. But ideally, pluralism goes beyond that and allows for the different theories to interact and to actually have a constructive dialogue and maybe allow the potential for change through this dialogue. And for economic students looking at the curriculum, that would be that they're actually aware of the fact that there isn't just one way to do economics, and most students nowadays are not aware of that. And that they get the capacity to actually critically engage with these different theories. But it's important that pluralism is not a competition it's not about fighting and then one school of thought emerges victoriously and they're the best and then everybody does what they want. Pluralism is maintaining the dialogue and maintaining the equality and the knowledge. There's a different way to do it and it's fine. Pluralism of methods, I mean that's quite straightforward, is to realize that there are different methods to analyze the economy. Mostly what is used is models, math-based models, which are great and do great stuff, but there's other things. There's quantitative methods you can draw on surveys, for example, to know, to learn something about the economy and what people want. There's qualitative research, talk to people, see what they think about economics or what they think about the economy. And for students, that would mean that they could actually understand that there's more out there than maths and formulas and models. And for them to know what they can use to answer a certain question, can they use different methods that tell them different things about a question that they want to answer to give them a more broad spectrum and approach to a question that interests them. And finally, pluralism of disciplines very basically means that economic
economics shouldn't be isolated from other disciplines and from other social sciences, but give room for interdisciplinarity. And so some heterodox schools of thought, pluralist schools of thought, have allowed for that. And so we have behavioral economics, or space and psychology, or feminist economics, which draws in sociology. But pluralism of disciplines implies a bit more than that, because it implies to realize that economics, in the end, analyzes something that is constructed through human interaction. So economics has to be able to analyze these human interactions and to understand how the world changes. And there are other disciplines that have done that. Other disciplines analyze human interactions. So it implies the question, well, what can we learn from them? What can we use that they give us? And for students to have this awareness that they aren't isolated in their economics bubble, but that there's other disciplines and other people who work on similar questions. And I'll finish by saying why, why we think that it's important to have pluralism. And I think it's important for two main reasons. The first is critical thinking. And I find critical thinking very interesting because it seems to be the buzzword for most universities. That if you look on their websites when I talk about their, degree, their degrees, they want students to be critical thinkers. But how can you expect someone to think critically if you always tell them what to do and what's right and what's wrong? Where, where's the critical thinking going to come from? And I think this is something that pluralism can do because pluralism is based on the realization that you might never really know what's right and what's wrong. And there's different ways to do it. So what you have to do is develop the mental capacities to evaluate different things and to deal with the fact that you might not know exactly what is right. And this is again a quote from our introduction where we try to sort of capture the spirit of pluralism as a way of dealing with uncertainty. Um, because we say that our book is an uncomfortable book, and it is, because we don't really say this is how to do it. And we don't offer our readers the relaxing certainty of a universal truth that explains everything, but on the contrary, we invite them to uncover glimpses of truth in a field characterized by fundamental uncertainty. And finally, I think that pluralism is not only important for education and for making students think on their own, but also for the discipline as such, because pluralism can keep a discipline healthy and strong. Because if you don't have alternative viewpoints that engage with each other, what you'll end up with is doing what you've always done, and this might not always work. This might not be the recipe that works forever. And if it doesn't, then your, then your ship sinks or your discipline does. And so understanding pluralism as a perpetual process that is ongoing and not reached, so you don't wake up one morning and you have pluralism. But this is something that you need to do over and over. This can make the discipline stronger because it's strengthened by questioning and by discussion and by inputs from different viewpoints. I hope I've been able to make that clear and also how our book maybe can contribute at least a little bit to making economics more pluralist. Thank you. Voting economic pluralism um, uh, last year, basically. And the thing there was, as I talked to lots of people about where things were with curriculum reform, with uh, the push for new thinking, pluralism, and so forth, there seemed to be a, a, a sort of battle going on between academics and students, and no one else involved. And it seemed to me that uh, that is a battle that's going to be difficult to win uh, for students, because the academics hold most of the cards. Uh, uh, they get to largely define uh, what they teach, uh, what good economics is, they stick around, students keep coming, you know, moving on, going on. Um, and it seemed to me that if change was going to have happen, there needed to be the rest of society engaged uh, in that debate uh, and, and in that change. Uh, and clearly there was a rationale for that in that economics has had a huge impact on policy uh, on the world we live. I mean, I think to give one example that really strikes me is, uh, is Friedman uh, and his idea back in the, in the 70s that the only duty of managers of companies should be to maximize shareholder value. 
Uh, now, it's interesting, that was published on a, uh, as an editorial uh, in a, on the, the front of the New York Times at the same time that General Motors was being attacked for having unsafe cars. Uh, at that point, uh, a book had come out uh, uh, called uh, General Motors Unsafe at Any Speed. So there was a push uh, uh, by a lot of NGOs, social and environmental groups, for companies to have that broader perspective to think of social, environmental, fuel efficiency, and all that. And that was half of the front page of the New York Times. And at the top was Friedman basically saying that any manager of a company that goes beyond maximizing shareholder value is really talking socialism. As a result, General Motors ignored uh, uh, most of the lessons, kept things away, and got left far behind business-wise. But it created a whole culture in business where you can sit there and say, yeah, I'm just maximizing uh, uh, shareholder value. I'm doing tax efficiency. What's wrong with tax efficiency? And of course, going overseas, by far the best way. And my mates in HMRC, I just go along and give them a nudge and, yeah, this will be okay, sure it'll be fine. So you get a whole culture where other values, broader values of environment, social equality, all these sort of things, get out of the window. And that was basically a major economist who stood up in a very political way on the front page of a newspaper and changed society dramatically. The problem is that most of the people out there uh, who are not studying economics uh, in the real world, as they say, um, find economics firstly very dull. Uh, and if they did it, they probably got hugely turned off it. Um, and, and also, it's an academic fight, it's between some students, some academic, you know, we're not going to get involved and so forth. So it's quite a job, actually, to get people to, to care uh, and actually see, chase back, if you like, from how they see the world to actually that going to how this is taught and the sort of ideas, uh, the ethics or a, a morality, if you like, uh, of uh, economics that gets sort of passed out uh, into the business world. So what we've created to try and um, counteract that is a magazine, and you can see uh, on your table, the Mint magazine, um, to try and make economics more engaging to, to people who aren't forced to do mathematical modeling uh, to get a degree, uh, and actually could enjoy reading uh, economics, and doesn't give always the same answers as the, the economist tends to do. Um, and we've also created, uh, or we're, we're creating an accreditation scheme for pluralist economics courses. As Lillian said, trying to work out what is pluralist and what is not is quite a, a tricky business. Uh, that in between, anything goes and there's one answer. Uh, there's, there's a lot of way, uh, spaces that you can be. What we're thinking is that we're going to create a dialogue, eventually an international dialogue, between students, academics, and people who employ, use economics to set up some sort of maybe minimum standard of what's required. Um, and obviously, as most courses uh, taught around the world uh, are modest as such, uh, then to get to a pluralist, you, know, uh, uh, you don't have to go maybe that far. Two or three extra uh, um, uh, methods would be, uh, would be a good start. But we know that this has to be done gradually, it's got to have credibility, it's got to bring people on board, but it's actually what's interesting, it begins to create a, a dialogue uh, between employers and, uh, and people in the, uh, out there uh, in policy, finance, business, uh, and thinking about what economics should be. So we've recruited a number of supporters. We've got the, the chairman of Legal and General. Uh, Legal and General is uh, the biggest, they tell me, uh, I have no reason to disbelieve them, uh, the biggest manager of investment funds in the whole of Europe. And, and they are supportive of pluralist economics. So obviously the steps are that they start to think, well, we want to employ people um, in our uh, in our organisation, uh, and it's interesting. I was told they have a chief investment officer um, who basically controls all their investment strategy across the whole of Europe, uh, biggest obviously in Europe. Uh, and I said, well, that sounds a bit like. Wouldn't you have an economist to do that, chief economist? And I said, oh no, we put them in a corner somewhere. They do a bit of modelling, but we don't actually. Uh, we find them very disappointing. Um, so, and that is why they're supporting it because they actually find people trained in, in economics not a huge amount of use in terms of understanding inter the international economic interactions. Uh, we have the chairman of Debenhams, we have a number of MPs, uh, think tanks, uh, we have the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of Grant Thornton, which is quite interesting. Grant Thornton 
are a, a accountancy consultancy firm. They're not in the big four, but they're one below. So they have about 40 or 50,000 employees around the world, uh, which is not insignificant. 40 or 50,000, that's presumably quite a lot. Um, and they actually, quite unusually, um, <clears throat> have developed a sort of, uh, had a stakeholder engagement uh, with, um, uh, across the UK at a local level about what the economy should look like. And they came up with this concept of a vibrant economy, which you don't think many consultants go out, you know, to, 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 to engage with the world and decide, well, what do we want, how do we want our economy to look like? And it turns out that the CEO of Grant Thornton had a very personal, dramatic, uh, impact of the crash in 2008. Uh, after it, she had to sack a lot of people. And personally, she found that quite a traumatic experience, as you might imagine. I mean, it's quite good that the CEO actually finds it traumatic to sack a lot of people. That's, I think, a tick uh, in the humanity box. Um, and, and there's a lot of evidence to say that sociopaths are generally the people who run companies. Um, so uh, this made her want to rethink um, how she should run her company and where it should go. So there are a range of people like this that we are going to bring with their, their companies along to actually say, we want people um, who have a pluralist economics uh, background, who can be critical, who can see different viewpoints. And I think this is where, I mean, you come to this problem of what is pluralism. I, uh, the first degree I did uh, was philosophy. And you take it for granted that everyone disagrees, there are lots of different thoughts, there's no right answers, and you argue and pity yourself. The second thing I did um, was train as a chartered accountant. And it's like, the question is, where is economics between a training as a chartered accountant, where there's lots of right answers, you may do various different tools and so forth, but it's all sort of straightforward. When I did a, a accountancy, we didn't sort of reflect on the theory of knowledge and whether there's a, it's possible for assets to be valued. And actually, there are quite good arguments to say they can't be, because given that they're about future returns, cash flows, uh, net present value of cash flows, and the future is inherently uncertain, then you can quite uh, easily come up with the idea that most assets are actually impossible to be valued. We didn't actually touch on that, and you probably wouldn't expect us to. So how can we develop something that gives that ability to be critical, to see different perspectives? I work in policy. I work for the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, when I'm not doing promoting economic pluralism. And I know what people need, the sort of skills people need to do good policy, to be good policy advisors. And the most useful thing I studied to do that was philosophy. Because actually it gave me the ability to understand different arguments coming from different frames, using different language. That don't, it's not a sort of right or wrong, it's actually totally different worldviews that come together. And to do policy, you really need to be able to read between the lines, you need to see where people are, how they're painting the world and so on. And that's where I think pluralism is really important. If you want to go on off and do econometric modeling in Ofgem uh, or whatever, that's fine, but maybe people should have the choice. Not everyone has to learn all the techniques, incre uh, incredibly sort of technical techniques. And often people say, well, we're not going to be able to fit in pluralism. Everyone's got to do macro, micro, econometrics, da da da. Where's the room for institutional economics, feminist e economics, etc.? Well, of course, there isn't if you take it that view. Maybe you should start by going broad and then decide which way you go. And if you want to learn all the very technical bits of economics and end up with uh, uh, working for Ofgen or Ofwat or somewhere like that, that's fine. I do warn you, though, that if there is renationalization, you're likely to lose your job. Um, so uh, a lot of people who've been trained in traditional economic techniques might find themselves out of work. Whereas if you've done pluralism and learned critical, can evolve, can go in different axes, you'll probably stay in work for much, more long, much longer in your life. Uh, so beware, if you're trained in something, then if that something doesn't exist anymore, you don't have a job, unless you retrain, of course. Uh, so I think we have to go back to basics as why we're studying economics, what the point is, and how people can be equipped for all life's possibilities by learning economics and not just to be able to do a certain level of technical modeling, because that ticks the box uh, of uh, the standard trained economist. Thank you very much.
Um, so it would be, be nice if people introduce themselves. Oh, yes. so Sorry, yeah. yeah. I'm a secondary economics student. My name is Leo from French. Um, um, you, you're all talking about uh, reforming the way we learn as students, the way we learn economics, which I think is great. But um, I feel I feel like, especially after going through first year, that the way we are assessed about economics is still quite conservative. As in, we're still all working out models and trying to, um, in a very mathematical and step-by-step -step way, trying to, to come up with answers that will satisfy the question, because there's literally one right answer. <laughs> so, um, don't you think that that's a bit um, counterproductive? As in, as a, as a student, the way I would learn about economics is aimed at, at having the highest score possible for the exam. So I will literally try to lit, uh, understand the model very um, um, in a very uh, fixed way and not very think critically, as is so important. So do you think, are you planning on, uh, on reforming the way we're assessed about economics? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question um, about how we best assess the kind of qualities that we're encouraging students to develop. And we, you know, there's a there's a there's a kind of trade-off. So I think that it is important to learn how to do things in order to develop confidence to be able to to, to actually understand, analyze the economy, not just talk about it. So to be able to actually do things that's our aim. You should feel that sort of confidence. Um, to some extent, we, tr we try in exam questions. I mean, there's, there's some, some uh, use of multiple choice questions, which I think can be can be framed in a way that, that it, it's not a but you can't do well by learning things off by heart. It does require really quite deep thinking about how how things work in order to do well. So I think it's not, a, it's not a sort of mechanical examination process. And then there are other questions which give you the opportunity to interpret a question, interpret data, construct a critical argument. Um, and though the, the kind of skills that, that get you high grades in those questions are not, again, they're not sort of regurgitation or learning, learning things by rote. And we would expect quite a variation in the sorts of answers that people give to those questions. But I think the other, um, maybe to take that a little bit further, is that we want to give uh, and encourage students to take the opportunity to do other things other than just concentrate on their exams. And I think we've been very successful in the department here um, in introducing the Exploricon conference, which uh, is a is a forum, it's got nothing to do with credit, we don't get credit for, for doing a poster or a presentation. And what it's done is it's really generated extraordinary kind of creativity, I think. I mean, the judges that we have from industry and from, from uh, the Bank of England, from The Economist, who become, uh, have been surprised year after year, I mean, I think it's been going three years now, at, the, at just at even the questions that students are asking because it really reveals a kind of a real curiosity and and the ability to frame a question and then to, to use some tools and to explore using different kinds of evidence um, how far you can get whether it's a question of mental health was one of the, the most interesting papers last year for example using in, insights from many disciplines as well as what the student learned in economics so I think that we are uh, generating that, that level of constructive engagement with students' own interests and own questions, critical uh, awareness. Uh, it may not all be captured in an exam score. Uh, it will, I hope, lead students to really dig into things like Exploricon and then you know, learn other skills as well doing that. So you know, we have to not be over-obsessed, and I think from our perspective as as teachers, we are sometimes a little, um, a, a, you know, a bit depressed at times at the over-focus of students on uh, either on getting internships or, or getting high scores in exams. And we would really encourage this broader engagement. Thank you. Well, I just want to make one quick comment. I myself participated in this board last year, and. Um, Frankly, it was a very great experience 
mainly because um, it was a unique opportunity to engage face to face with um, academics within an economics department, which is a very rare opportunity. I mean, sometimes lectures have um, almost 200 students in one lecture room, don't have to speak to a lecturer or some other researchers within the department face to face. But um, it's a very great opportunity from learning experience perspective as well as um, in many others. So um, if any of you have a chance to go for it, um, strongly recommend. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Peter and I'm just considering for a master's here in economics as well. I was going to ask the panel how they would respond to the point that's often brought up in academia that the people who are currently designing the curriculum are those who are the most experienced in economics and therefore they are, I don't know, they would have the best ideas for what economics should be and therefore are in the best place to design the curriculum and why should they listen to the rest of the students who are recommending things like yeah, sure. Um, well, I think that there's a couple of problems with this view. I mean, first, I think everybody would agree that there is a strong tendency for the but we've always done it that way view in, in any discipline or in any school of thought. So the argument itself seems to be logically flawed to me from the start. And then secondly, there is a huge bias, let me put it straight, there is a huge bias against heterodox economists in many universities and also in research. Um, I think the REF research framework that rates economics journals, um, so you can get five stars, that's the best, um, has rated only two or three heterodox economics journals better than three stars in the past years. Well, you could say that's because heterodox e economics just doesn't have the academic quality of neoclassical economics. I seriously doubt that. So I think that there is a certain academic bias against heterodox economics. There's also um, heartbreaking stories of economics departments and heterodox economists who were teaching there who weren't allowed to remain teaching at that school. So I think that we have to be aware of the fact that there is a strong wish to maintain neoclassical economics as the paradigm and not let other schools of thought sort of play in the game. Um, and this, I think, is a strong counter-argument against saying, well, those who do it know it best. No, those who do it want to remain those who do it and not let other people participate. That's what I would say. Yes, well, I think here um, there's a lot of useful um, discipline, um, academic sort of research around institutions. Uh, and sociology can, can uh, give a, a lot of insight because, yes, I think it's not a neutral thing, the question of what counts. Uh, as economics. And, and I think it's interesting um, Wendy saying, don't just talk about economics, you've got to be able to do it. Then the question is, well, what does it mean to do economics? Uh, because institutional economics would see maybe doing economics as analyzing language. Um, because actually, to understand institutional change, understanding the dominance of particular forms of language, is quite a good indicator. So if you, for instance, studied the use of the term incentives, uh, I would say that would give a lot of insight into the dominance of a particular way of thinking about the world uh, because now it's got into sort of common parlance. Everyone, you've got to get the incentives right. People only do it because of incentives. Now, that is a very specific view of how people act. Uh, it's individualistic. It's about that people are effectively responsive to uh, uh, incentives, to rewards, uh, uh, sort of Pavlovian sort of uh, response. But it's become totally sort of pervasive and it's affected values cultures and so forth in the banking sector and affecting economics dramatically. But I would be, you know, be very difficult to find in, uh, I would think in most economics departments, anyone studying uh, language, uh, the language used in economics. So, and there can be a lot of other examples, you know, depending on what, what, to, what it is to do economics is in itself uh, a controversial thing. But in terms of institutions, there are certain rules of success. Institutions have certain value stories about what is a good thing to do and how you get on. 
And so what has happened, uh, if you analyze economics, I think, from an institutional perspective, is that one institution, one set of values, a club, a certain, uh, 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 a set of people with certain sort of relationships have dominated. And, and, and that means that there's certain things that are acceptable to be done, certain theories. You've basically got to talk optimization. You've got to talk preferences. You've got to talk utility maximization, or you get kicked out of the club. This great book on pluralism uh, by a guy at Houston Christian University or something, where he, he doesn't just analyze the different methods of thought, he analyzes the social norms that people have to meet to stay in that club. So that each method is not just some sort of analytically sort of neutral thing, it's actually a club of people who share a set of values. So you have to see what is at the moment is that one particular club of people with a certain set of values have now come to dominate uh, economic academia. Uh, and that, of course, changes because before 1970, it was another set of people with another set of values, another set of uh, uh, beliefs about what counted as doing economics who dominated. And that changed dramatically, and it can change again. And in this time of flux and change, this is classically after a crisis, that's when it changes, it means that effectively to take what the, the current people who are in charge and, and take them as neutral is precisely probably taking uh, what was the old and failed paradigm as, uh, as, and, and listening to them and actually avoiding creating a new one which is clearly need, needed by and demonstrated by the huge crisis in economics that occurred with this inability not to predict the crash but to actually represent it or understand it. When? Yeah. Um... I feel slightly um, in a slightly odd position since I, when I talked, I tried to explain that uh, the way that we, we develop the curriculum is to precisely put in place uh, a view of people which goes beyond pure self-regarding motives to include uh, uh, social preferences, to stress the importance of social norms, to, to do economics in the sense of trying to find out how people behave in response to incentives. So, for example, um, one thing that economists have done is to, to look at what happens when fines are imposed on uh, parents when, when picking up their kids from kindergarten. And so, you know, I think Henry's view would be that all econ economists and probably I would say that if you, if you impose a fine on parents picking their kids up late, then uh, they, people will try to avoid the fine, and so they'll pick up their kids on time. So how do we know whether that's how people behave? Well, what economists tend to do is to run an experiment and to introduce fines and see what happens. And when they did this, they found that uh, once they introduced fines, late pickups increased dramatically. Uh, why? Because it broke a social norm, which was that you actually cared about the kindergarten teachers. You wanted the kindergarten teachers to have a good relationship with your kids. Uh, so you did your best to get there on time. When this relationship was turned into a monetary relationship and you could expunge your guilty conscience by paying a fine, then you were perfectly happy to turn up late. And what was very disappointing about this uh, uh, what, what was uncovered by the experiment was that when they took away the fine, the behaviour did not revert <laughs> to what it was before the fine. So that's what I mean about how economic, how economists now think, how they, the kinds of methods that they use, very different kinds of methods like <coughs> conducting experiments like this. And that it's the accretion of knowledge, of new knowledge, over the last 30 or 40 years through, uh, through whole number of different kinds of methods, that we now do have a very different way of thinking about the economy, about people, about their interactions, about institutions, as some of the students here will know, we first, in, we first introduce students to in, in institutions by looking at the constitutions of pirate ships in the 18th century. Uh, this is a very rich way of helping students to understand what they, what they come to do, which is to understand the economy. It's not about economics, it's about understanding the economy and acquiring a set of tools that help you to do that and to think critically. And to come, come back to your question, 
I think we have a lot of uh, grounds for optimism. We've had enormous uh, take up of this new way of teaching economics across the world over the last couple of years. We've got hundreds of uh, departments um, which are either using it or considering using it. Um, it we've got, uh, I think, 5,500 teachers now across the world registered using the, the resources. So it is possible to change things. It really is. And it's possible if you get, if you can pull together a big group of, uh, of researchers who really want to do something about making teaching better and you produce really good material in an accessible, open access way, then people will, will use it because you can reduce the costs of, um, of change. It's, you don't just have to stick to what you've, always, what you've always done. And actually, teachers are now finding it's much more fun. Much more fun to be really talking about the economy and getting the students uh, very engaged with it. So I'm much more optimistic. And I think that there's a very false um, kind of language that's used, which paints somehow anyone who is able either to have an effect or is working in an economics department as a sort of neoclassical, um, unreconstructed, somehow um, person who isn't interested in bringing all kinds of new ideas, new techniques, new methods, uh, all kinds of criticism, all kinds of curiosity into the way we think and teach about economics. So I, my idea is that we should get a, a broader group to really love economics and to get in there and make it better. And that's what we're trying to do. Sorry, it seems like um, Alan's been signaling me. We have five minutes left. Um, no, we still have plenty of time, but please just okay, go. Okay, so <laughs> could I pack the question? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Michelle. Um, I'm from South Africa, uh, but I just recently arrived here in the UK. Um, I'm studying uh, my master's. Mm -hmm. uh, so I come from a country which teaches a very deeply neoclassical you know, perspective in most of our universities. Um, I, I've heard you uh, speak with me just recently at the Economic Society South Africa's conference. Oh, Graham's town? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and so, good fun it was too. <laughs> yeah, and so while I, I definitely think that there is so much improvement in the way that CORE tries to approach economics, and I especially think it's wonderful that you know it's available online as someone who's a very young lecturer back home. Yeah. Um, it's really, really difficult to get resources without you as a lone academic trying to construct a brand new curriculum for your students. It's really great to have access to online resources. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate that. But I, I wonder why there seems to be this mutually exclusive understanding of, of purism. So, I, I mean, maybe there are just really genuinely practical reasons which I'm interested in trying to understand. Mm -hmm. But why can we not have within the core textbook discussions about feminist economics? Why can we not have discussions within the core textbook of Marxist economics? And I mean, maybe the answer to that is just realistically what employers are looking for is like they don't really care about a student's understanding of what the value of labor really means. And then like let's just be upfront about that and say like if you're planning on getting a job, then skills of critical analysis about complexity economics is really not what's going to get you the job. So yes, this is what mainstream economics is, this is what the textbook's about, and we can only stretch pluralism so far. But I think we need to start to have a discussion about are what we're fighting for as a pluralistic movement, are there some things that are mutually exclusive? Okay, it's a good, it's a, it's a really great question. Because I think, I mean, I've always said, and I, I, I think everyone who's been involved in the project is, has been very uh, grateful and very um, welcoming of the push from students. I mean, that's what got this project going. So now we have, you know, a massive, uh, amount of uh, engagement in, in using CORE, so Pretoria University is, uh, is going to use it from the beginning of next year with 2,500 students. So this is, I think, you know, very, very, you know, it really shows that you can change things. Um, but this has happened because students have got engaged and have been pushing. But I think there are just there are just different things, and it's not, I think, uh, so one thing that we've done for a few years now is to really encourage people in rethinking 
and more generally in pluralist networks, to produce a rethinking core reader. And we actually gave very detailed suggestions about how this might be done, and you know, kind of kicking it off by saying, well, why don't you, you know, think about, for example, take a concept like power, and then look at how we deal with that, and the different ways in which that emerges, and then think about where you would bring in a feminist perspective, where you would connect the Marxist perspective, okay, which is in the principal agent problem, where you would bring in uh, other, other perspectives, and show the links to, if you like, the, the pluralist um, literature. And that, you know, for some, for some students, I think they would, find that, that they would find that really interesting. And it would be a kind of really concrete, instead of sort of having the, these sort of different kind of isms, which are fine, you know, a feminist view or an ecological view or whatever. But I think what would be more, maybe more empowering for students would be to see those different perspectives at work, right? In, in, in connection with concrete problems. So thinking about the depression, for example, you know, what, what's the insight that Austrian economics gives us about that? Or thinking about the problem of, of understanding inequality in South Africa. So if you look at Unit 22, where we um, begin the final unit of the core text with, with the life of Cyril Ramaphosa, okay, from, from, uh, from trade unionists to the richest man in Africa. Uh, so th there's a question that I think what I'm really asking for and what I think would be, would be very useful is, is rather than a sort of dialogue of the deaf, um, really showing where you're going to get extra leverage on particular problems. So we have a whole unit on the environment what does ecological economics, what are the special particular methods of ecological economics, perhaps methods that Henry's interested in, such as agent-based models, how could they, you know, could you, for example, devise an agent-based model of the tragedy of the commons that students could engage with and see that, okay, that's something that's come out of ecological economics that gives us insight on, on a problem that we're trying to explain to students. So we're not shutting anything out. We're, we're very open to other methods, other insights. If you've looked at the book, no, I can see that nobody here has actually brought it with them, whether anybody's brought it. It's a different question. But yeah, it's like a weightlifting. Um, it's 1,100 really pages. And, uh, you know, so the, I think a, a, a beautifully slim, like your volume, a lovely slim volume of um, a rethinking reader with, you know, the tied in to different, <laughs> to, you know, to different, but, but for me it's got to be connected to something concrete, like a particular problem, understanding, uh, understanding a, a, an aspect of globalization, for example. We talk about innovation systems and compare Silicon Valley to the German innovation system, resting very heavily on uh, institutional insights. But we don't have a big label saying, this is pluralism. But it's using, you know, different schools of economists have, have built an understanding of, the, you know, the German innovation system, you know, uh, incremental innovation versus the radical innovation of Silicon Valley. That's in the core textbook. So, you know, if you, could, if you can think of bringing in other things that, you know, but have a look. And, you know, it's incredibly, it's got incredible wide range of things in there. But because we happen to use the insight of Coase and Marx about the labour market, we don't call it Marxist economics. That's just the way the labour market works. Right? Yeah. So I suppose the question is like, why aren't you saying this is pluralism? If it is pluralism. Because it's not, it's saying this is about, this is economics. It's, it's, a much bigger, <laughs> it's a much bigger argument. It's not saying, as Henry suggested, that you, you people will learn the models and we'll put you off in a corner, in some, uh, some corner of, uh, of, of, of PwC or whatever. You technically trained economists, just sort of go over there. And we philosophers or other people... But that is evidently false. As, as anyone looking at that table will tell you if, you, if you don't look at what's in there and you don't take seriously the dramatic shift in the paradigm from the neoclassical Samuel paradigm 
to what is in the cortex, then I think there's a problem with, with understanding and comprehension. But I think it to is suggest that it's lipstick on a pig, as it's been referred to, uh, is I think fails to take seriously. And I mean, you can you can look at it, and I can. I'm saying well, that that's the conclusion they take. I mean, my reading of it uh, was just that. Uh, I love the sort of scope and the, the, the challenge and the ambition and the issues it tried to tackle with, but I always felt it sort of came back when you sort of got to the, the bottom to the same sort of ways of getting the answers. And, and it didn't explicitly deal with these fundamentals in a lot of uh, you know, disciplines. You see this this way or that way. Well, I thought your institutional chapter, I mean, as I pointed out, you know, the fact that the leading institutional economist uh, in the UK is Jeff Hodson and he wasn't referenced. Uh, I don't know if that's changed, but that was a year or so ago. Um, and then you said to me, well, he's a bit difficult to read. And I thought, well, I did philosophy, and you tend to have to read difficult things. I don't, never felt he was difficult to read. And so I just felt you were sort of excluding. He comes from outside, so you don't let him in. And I thought the way you analyze institutions was very much a sort of, uh, as I remember, sort of game through the optimization. You use the same tools. Um, now, in, uh, uh, in institutional ideas, there's a, there's a range of sort of team decision-making ideas that uh, talk about, you yeah, actually talk seriously about norms and don't see them as emerging from a sort of game theory multiple interaction, for instance, um, and have different, very different perspectives. And I think to be more explicit, even at that lower level, that there are very different perspectives at a very deep level about what is going on uh, and how to approach it methodologically and so forth, means that people are suspicious because for the last 30 years, they've been excluded. So unless you go jump a bit further and actually get up, yes, shout from the rooftops, there are different ways of thinking. We accept that. We think you're just trying to hide it, you know, just protect your position. All right, Henry, let me just pause you here. Here are brief comments on that particular point from Wendy and move on to Lillian, because I'm, I'm dying to hear what Lillian thinks about this. No, no, I think I've, I think I've said everything I want to say, and the challenge is there. Uh, I think it's just that we need very specific um, you know, for, for it to be useful, it would be fantastic to have specific examples. So I've already given one, which I think would be wonderful uh, in terms of showing the value of different kinds of methodologies. We don't have yet have an agent-based model associated with the text. We would love to have one, but it has to be. You know, if you're if you're in a teaching environment, there's no point teaching a model, an agent-based model that's about some different problem. You want you know, we have loads of problems in the text. So just one of them, like a tragedy of the commons or a housing bubble, for example, we might be good ways of showing how that particular method is better than some of the, the methods that we use at the moment, which are uh, a stress on, for example, using experiments like the kind of the field experiment I talked about. We, we were sure we used lots of lab experiments, lots of data, and so on. But it would be great to have um, Students also getting uh, get into a position where they themselves can code an agent-based model, so they would really feel that you know they they're developing a skill that would help them use that sort of methodology, perhaps in a in a work or a more a community organisation setting. So you know we're all for we're all for for that. That would be that would be terrific. So that's one concrete example. All right, William. Yeah, um, so I mean, the criticism that Henry just voiced is basically the criticism that we think in economics has, has made about poor time and again. So I won't repeat all that because I also don't think that is very constructive to say it again. Um, so I'll just comment on, on two points that you made when you said you'd be happy about people actually contributing to specific aspects of pluralism. And I have two problems with that. One is that you for Michelle's question, you said, well, because that's not pluralism, that's economics. And I think that this, this way of formulating it is, is something that we in rethinking would be very careful with, because we don't want to tell people anymore, this is economics. We want to tell them, find out the different things that are out there, and then make up your own mind about what's economics. We, we don't want to tell them, well, this is just how the labor market works. We want to tell them, well, this is five different ways of understanding it, so think about it. See, see what you can do with it. And then the second thing is that I think it's very difficult to always fit different schools of thought into specific questions because, for example, as especially ecological economists would argue, what they're doing concerns everything in economic analysis. 
they're not, they, they would probably be very unhappy to be put only in a chapter about environmental challenges because the way that they analyze the economy takes into account environmental or planetary boundaries in every single aspect. So, I mean, obviously, we would love to contribute pluralism to core. I mean, that's out of the question. But I think that, and this is what I meant with the, we have to talk and pluralism is continuous negotiation and questioning because it might be very difficult to always see where, where do we fit in pluralism. And I don't even like the way of saying that because it sounds like you again want to put it somewhere and then there's the pluralism and then here's the rest. But because the challenge will be to have pluralism everywhere and I'm not going to say this is how we're going to do it, but I think it will be a challenge to do it in a way that does justice to the really fundamentally different approaches to economics. Yeah, so can I just, so would you be happy, I mean, so it sounds like actually you wouldn't want to do what I thought you might like. <laughs> so I thought that one, so one thing that we would have uh, expected to come out of um, places that where students are, are, are doing the core, because just as a footnote, the subtext of a lot of group thinking is students will go and learn economics somewhere else. They'll go and do so-called neoclassical economics, and we actually would be fine if they do that. Our argument is no thank you, they should be doing core, right? So, and maybe you might think about that, whether you think they find that you're kind of indifferent between whether they do a standard economics course, learn all the technical modeling, or whether they do core, right? So if you don't care about that, then you maybe haven't quite taken on board. <laughs> or you might want to think about how we've dramatically changed. I mean, we do know that. We, we have acknowledged that on a number of occasions that yeah. you know, choosing between standard and you know, classic. And yeah. So then the thing we would have thought is that students who, who are doing core, because we do really highlight the insights from many different schools and many different thinkers, um, there might emerge a demand for a course on, for example, history of economic thought. So that you know, that you imagine, and uh, certainly in, in, in a number of universities where we've, we've talked about this, that has kind of bubbled up, and sometimes they don't have people who can teach it. So that would be a great case, actually, for creating fabulous online resources, uh, because then, you know, in places where you can't access a course, you could, you could get, get hold of the resources. Um, but from what you said, you, you might be a little bit anxious about that. Um, uh, because somehow that is is not what you have in mind. So I'm because I, I thought you would really like that. Uh, so sort of complementary to 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 doing economics, you might do a course in economic history, which I think would be fantastic and valuable as well. And you might do a course in um, in history of econ economic thought, which would uh, discuss. I mean, could be done sort of thematically, which is would be my preference, but. Maybe you would prefer to do it by kind of Islamic or school, like a feminist or an ecological Christian uh, in uh, that work. How would you feel about that? Well, the, the only problem that I just personally have with calling it history of economic thought is that to me, this sort of just linguistically suggests that that's all history. <laughs> so, you know, we had. Oh, no, well, you wouldn't have to call it that. What would you like to call it? Pluralist <laughs> economics. <laughs> so, 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 what, so that's fine. I think you know if it any uh, the, the, you know if students were were asking for that, and there were there was uh, that would seem to me a fine thing for students to do as a complement to what they're studying in economics. And I think it would be. But why should it be a complement? Because I mean, they've got to learn some economics. And ah, know. so <laughs> that's real. Yeah. When do you give yourself away with your language? Give, I, no, I'm you give yourself away all the time. You said they have to learn some economics. So by definition, that wouldn't be economics. Okay, well maybe we should ask the students whether they think they need to learn some economics. I think before well, asking what is more economics, then? What do you mean by economics? Because you, you're very happy to say there are some technical people who are sitting in an office. No, I'm not. No, I don't. That's, that's a bad outcome. So we don't need we don't need people who actually, for example, understand how to. Uh, calculate uh, the dynamics of public debt. We don't need people no, I'm saying, I'm to no, understand. But not everyone needs to do that. Well, th okay, but that's maybe that's we should what ask people what they do. Before, I think that's brilliant, Padia. Could I just um, say, 
let's wrap up this session with camera recording and panel sitting here in a very formal manner um, with this ending note. And if any of you want to just stay around for maybe 20 no, I would minutes, really love to yeah, exactly, exactly. Emoji, but I'd love to hear what the students Exactly, say. and um, come up to the panelists and ask some questions and hear some answers. That would be great. Thank you everyone so much for coming. This was a great opportunity, and um, thanks for the panelists.